for zone sync. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Welcome back. It is officially Ooh. the relaunch because we've oh, had many, man. many, many relaunch, but I guess we don't need our scripts. I mean, take it away, boys. We actually do need our script. We've been prepping for this for <laughs> weeks. Happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I late? <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Let's go. Let's let's, let's start. Let's take, go. It let's let's go. Let's take it from the top. Let's take it from the top. Thank let's you go. so much. So we were just taking a break, getting our studios ready. We're back at the WGN studios and check out this view. It is an amazing space. Welcome back, Nick. I have not seen you and I've been very happy. <sighs> Tell the truth to everybody. I was just on strike and you refused to do a show until I came back. But now that I'm getting paid absolutely nothing, Rocco, which is more than last time, you please? we're back. I think he got a little bored and actually wanted to come back a little bit sooner, but we got delayed. Due to the construction in the new building here at 303 East Wacker. You should have hired stage two properties to do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Over timeline. Oh, over budget, over timeline. Okay, okay, okay. You guys are the guests. We're the boss. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry. We, we will shut we will, up. We will, get, we will get you. We'll get you in there, bro. Oh, man. You see well, what you know what? This is what it's going to be like here at the new studio. Let's just rip yeah. right into it then, huh? I guess. Let's get, let's this get into crazy. it. Well, since, since you guys are already introducing yourselves, um, why don't you just let's let's let them introduce from, themselves. Let's start from the left and go to the right. We have two guests here today from Stage 2 Properties, Colin Egglesfield. And, well, to, from the left is Tyler Neitzel, and to the right is Colin Egglesfield. How you doing, guys? Great. How uh, are you guys doing? So what we do, good, thank you, and good. full of energy today. Thank you again. Um, what we do here is we typically let you guys tell a little something about yourself, a little background, and then lead your way into how you're doing what, what you're doing now. So we'll start with you, Tyler. Okay. Um, my name is Tyler Neitzel. Up a little from, to the mic. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Tyler Neitzel, originally from San Diego, California. Uh, moved to Los Angeles with my family when I was nine for acting, actually. My older brother, older sister, and I were all uh, child actors, like the epitome of child actors, like on set from the time I was five years old, professionally managed, represented at seven, doing TV by 12, doing movies by 16. And, uh, and then when I was 18, Didn't you I, kill the wolf in 300? Yeah, I was getting I know he looks familiar. Colin. I was getting, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you look so uh, familiar. Yeah, the, the movie 300, I was the kid in the snow that killed the wolf. Um, you look familiar. He was a young the whole, Leonidas. The whole thing, yeah, there you young go. King Leonidas. There you go. Um, I remember that. That will forever be... I mean, the you coolest thing I've ever done. You definitely didn't look like the Persian king, but you know. <laughs> but I put you in the wolf kid. Yeah, yeah, the wolf kid for sure. Yeah, the wolf kid for sure. And uh, so, yeah, that, I did that when I was like 16. And I continued acting until uh, my early 20s. But at 18, uh, I was in college. For three weeks, I decided to drop out. It wasn't for me. And I started my first business. Uh, and I just started businesses between 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. That's when I found real estate. I was sitting on the couch. Uh, watching a TV show about uh, restaurant space because my buddy wanted to open up some restaurant franchise in LA and uh, a real estate flipping show came on and I was watching the, this couple flip real estate and I was like I could do that oh I could probably do that so I googled it how to flip houses and then you go to these like seminars and they try to charge you a lot of money but you can go for free for a while before they start charging you a lot of money and uh, and so I started networking and work for a family friend who was flipping houses in uh, in Southern California at the time, and then uh, Colin and I linked up, and that's when uh, we we, <laughs> we <laughs> figured out that we were both very interested in real estate. So we started uh, we started stage two properties together, and so then the story continues. But I'll let Colin take it. Well, yeah, let's yep. let Colin let's talk get, here let's a little get, bit. Let's yeah. get the Colin. Tyler is a lot a more bit. confident about the whole real estate thing. I just kind of was like, you know what, <laughs> my acting career is uh, it's going. Not so great at the moment. Uh, you know, with acting, I've been acting for about 20 years. Never thought I'd actually be doing this. I grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago, Crete, Moni area. Um, went to University of Iowa. Thought I was going to go to medical school. Ended up majoring in biology pre-med. Took the MCAT. And right before I graduated, I entered into this model search thingy or whatever. Mm -hmm. Ended up in mm -hmm. Milan, Italy and, and doing runway shows and all this like fun, crazy stuff. And I figured... Did you have Elton uh, dinner with Elton <clears throat> John? <laughs> you know, just to I throw did, it right back Tyler. At you. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know, we're How best friends. That? Oh, he's he's doing great. We oh. just had his villa this this past weekend in Lake Como. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I think this um, is like the best because it's typically Nick who just can't get over I'm, himself. I'm just. I'm, <laughs> just, I'm, <laughs> yeah. this I'm, is a real estate I'm, show, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm watching this. Me. So I'm, I built Elton John's doghouse, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, wow. You, you know, I just one of these like IKEA things that no. <laughs> totally kidding. But I ended up uh, in Los Angeles after being in New York City for a while, jumped into acting, fell in love with it, caught the acting bug. Um, like I said, was in uh, Los Angeles, ran into Tyler in an acting class about 10 years ago. 
Um, and, you know, with acting, it's very up and down. You, you'll work for a while, and then you'll go stretches without work. So I knew I needed to do something in between my acting jobs, otherwise, otherwise I was going to go crazy. Uh, started talking to Tyler about some stuff, and we both have an op- entrepreneurial background, and the whole the subject of real estate came up. And just by happenstance, I was uh, at home, so on Facebook for this ad for, you know, uh, I don't know if you've, you've heard of Tarek and Christina, Flip or Flop. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so I saw one of the ads for, they do these educational uh, programs where you go and you learn how to flip houses. And it's, you know, it's like you go to this weekend seminar and they talk about like just the basics of real estate. And then if you want to really get into it, you can take like the whole dive in and spend, you know, a Thousands. crap load of money. Yeah. And I figured, you know what, if I was going to spend this amount of money going to medical school, I might as well spend like a fraction of that to actually learn how to do real estate. Uh, so we jumped in and three and a half years later, we've rehabbed, what, six houses. Six, yeah. We're on our seventh and eighth. We have uh, four rental properties. Um, we've failed. We've succeeded. We've made huge mistakes. We've had hey, you sound like actors. gains. And, yeah, you sound like <laughs> actors. Much a lot like acting. Now I got to back um, you up because you probably don't remember this, but it's a long time ago. Um, I actually met you at that model search. What? Oh, you were the guy that like I was took speaking. that spot in front of me. And yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you were, yeah, you were the model. You were the guy yeah. who didn't make so, it. So, and, and the only reason I remember <laughs> you, and, the, and, the, and the, no, I was actually speaking when he was actually coming. He was coming into the industry when I was actually getting out of the industry. Like, and so the reason I remember you briefly is because you became friends with some of the other models that I used to keep the kings, Stephanie oh, yeah. and. Yeah. And whatnot. And then one day, you know, and we all break apart and don't see each other and all that stuff. And then one day I'm watching TV and one of our favorite shows, Grocco, was Nip Tuck. Yeah. And then you're on the screen and I'm like, I know this dude from somewhere. And it freaked me out for a second. I'm like, how do I? And then, but, you know, you don't associate modeling with acting right yeah. away. You're, I remember the model briefly. And then, and then I called the bus, somebody else, and they're like, yeah, that's Colin. I'm like, oh, and there we are. Yeah. So, small yeah, world. I'm, uh, small yeah. world. Never but I was, at, I, I, was at that, I was at that model that. search. Yeah. So, Pretty gentlemen, crazy. why don't we take this over crazy. to uh, some real estate talk so yeah. that everybody who's watching today can get some insight as to what's trending in the market. <clears throat> After all, we are a real estate show. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So yeah. Shit. Here <laughs> this is a Carla. Fashion. You're welcome. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Carla's here. <laughs> Go ahead. Can I do Go ahead. Go ahead. So there's a lot of talk, right, about this, like, bubble, right? Everybody's getting into the market. There seems to be an inflation, especially in this market now in the summer months where everybody can't seem to find mm-hmm. properties. There's a shortage of inventory. Mm-hmm. So it's obviously escalating values. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, like your average consumer who maybe b- is making $60,000 a year, what have you, um, doesn't find that product, right, because people are sitting on it. Interest rates are still very low, and people are still holding on to their product. So – Everybody seems to think that there is this inflation bubble, like something's going to have to give. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people where properties are switching hands without, you know, three or four times before it makes it to the end consumer. And so we're getting people like yourselves who are taking advantage of this market and are coming in and flipping properties. So having said that about the market, what really s- motivated you to get into the real estate business and how are you taking advantage of it? We just saw so many people getting into it. and We saw that there was a lot of opportunity. We, you know, we, living in California, we tried to look at doing it in Los Angeles, but the price points there are like five times of what they are here just to get into a property. Like here, you can get into a house for $50,000, put 50 to 70 into it, and then exit out at 170 to 180, you know, upwards of 200,000. 20 minutes south of downtown. In LA, you'd have to go hours outside. You know, belly property. Yeah, it, the same three bed, two bath house here in Chicago for fifty to seventy thousand dollars is like three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, and then you got to put another seventy thousand into it just to make thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, you're looking like an eight to ten percent profit margin, and you're risking a lot of money. You know, right, so there, you're looking so. at cities like, like this Chicago being more of a the acquisition is a little bit more reasonable. Yep, it's a great place. Yeah, yeah, yeah to flip houses in terms of margin and yeah. A lot of economists are saying that, you know, don't get into real estate when everybody else is getting into it. Don't buy just because everybody's getting into it or, you know, you're an investor, you're flipping. No. So what do you say to that? Yeah, it's all about just buying a property at the right price. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the market is doing as long as you get into a property at the right price mm-hmm. and you know that you're giving yourself – I mean, you can't really tell what six months down the road is going to be, and that's why getting into these bigger properties now that we are getting into, we're getting a little more speculative. Um, but at the same time – um, we feel like there's enough margin in the properties that we get into that even if there is a pullback, we still are safe. We're safe. And how yeah, often do you plan on like the 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 
oh, scenario where, like, if you have to rent it. Because sometimes you have to look at a property like, what if this thing doesn't move? What can we do with it? Is there not a contingency plan? Because that's one thing that we try to teach people that listen to our show. Because flipping does go bad once in a while. We, we see it. Yeah. We think everyone else is going to see it. And we've all been caught in a project that just isn't moving once in a while. But how often is that part of the dynamic of what you guys are doing? You know, it's always in the back of your mind. Uh, what the worst like case worst scenario, case scenario we could be. rent it out. Yeah, still and... but we've we've never run into the worst case scenario and ended up <laughs> renting it out. Good. You know, we've run into a, a bad scenario and then ended up selling it. Right. You know, at no profit. You know, yeah. that's one thing. You go back to your financiers and you say, "Hey, didn't make any money on this, but we've got three other houses that we're working on right now. Where yeah. are you going to make money?" Uh, we'd rather do that in identifying uh, you know potential properties to flip. And in identifying potential properties to hold on to for five to ten years, the cash flow, it's a completely different business model for us. Yeah. So to, to transition that, yeah, some people might say, hey, the best thing to do here would just be to refinance it, put some tenants in it and hold on to it. We haven't we haven't executed that play yet. But I want to expand on what Colin was saying earlier to get back to your question, Carla, about let, that macro market. What do you say when people are all getting into real estate? Why would you get into it, too? Um, there is no 10-year period since we've been recording real estate values in the United States where real estate's been worth less at the end of 10 years than before. So if you're looking at it in a long-term strategy, uh, and that includes the Great Depression, I, yeah, it's, it's surprising. But that, and, and could that could this wave right now of appreciation where at like year eight, right? Could this be the first time that it happens? Sure. But if you're looking at it as a long-term strategy, then as long as you're acquiring a good price, like Colin said, <laughs> yeah. you're bringing projects in on schedule and, and, and on budget, you're able to force appreciation and bring value to and your I, company. And I love that you say that about the Great Depression, right? Because a lot of, a lot of the economists are, are luring to that fact. It's like, okay, we're in year 2018, 2020. What are we speculating? You know, mm-hmm. with the prices and inflation being so high and then also job growth not, you know, equaling to that and people just being priced out of the market. Your average consumer is getting priced out of the market. And we are creating product for the end consumer. So that's where, you know, a lot of people are fearful to get into the business. But you're coming in at one of the hottest times in the market and you're saying we're going to take advantage of that and you're doing it successfully so for that investor that's like a first-time investor that it's seeing us and it's saying okay you guys are reaping up reaping the benefits of this how can i get started so share your story as to how you got started yeah so just to clarify too when i got into it five years ago it wasn't the market that we're looking at today and when we brought our business to chicago from los angeles it <clears> wasn't <throat> the market we're looking at today the houses that we were picking up for forty five thousand dollars are now going for what sixty five 70 grand. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. the margins for investors are shrinking. Uh, Chicago, right. uh, Cook County issued, what, 2,000 building permits last year, which is a record number. Um, there, you know, everyone heard that the South Side is lucrative, so we're down there uh, buying properties for 45 to 60 grand, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, wait, why, why is this property going for 60 to 70 now? Yeah. Well, now we need to get into uh, multi-unit. Now we need to look at, you know, a longer term play. Now we need to expand from the south side into the northwest, right? Uh, areas like Portage, Jefferson, Irving, Mayfair, those areas where um, there's still room to grow and there's still a profit margin for investors. So it's sort of, you know, been a diversica- diversification over the last few months, I guess, since uh, what, like September, since we started realizing that we're going to get priced out, you know, of that. And I love that you're mentioning those neighborhoods, right? Because we're from Chicago. And so you have a lot of people who are natives of Chicago, and they're not taking advantage of this per se boom, or opportunity in real estate. And you're looking at different neighborhoods, right? So you're talking about the south side. Obviously, a lot of people will say the higher the risk, the higher the investment, right? That you're going to get better yields. Um, I, in particular, did invest in South Shore, and also I'm in Dalton now. Um, we're doing a flip there. Acquisition was really low. It's about $40,000, and we're into it. 62000 with an after sa- after repair value of about one sixty. So as long as the product comes back on the market in time, we'll mm-hmm. be fine. But mm-hmm. you're finding that permits and all that jazz also delays the process. Um, I love the fact that you mentioned some areas in the north side of Chicago. I actually was working with an investor who's actually looking into these neighborhoods. And we're looking at the near west side um, with the June average uh, increase per um, versus prior year at 16% increase. But the acquisition in these neighborhoods are going to be at a higher level. 
um, 535,000 for a multi-unit there. Hermosa is also showing a 12% increase versus a year ago, uh, but the acquisition there starts at 333 on an average. Humble Park, ladies and gentlemen, mm. everybody's gravitating to the south side of Humble Park, and that's a 13% increase versus a year ago. And the acquisition cost there is $271,000 for a two-flat, meaning that if you're just going to do some, you know, cosmetic lipstick surgery, as I like to say it, and you're going to actually be an end user, this is a great pr um, area for you to start and, you know, use it so that it can comfort some of that income so that you don't have to absorb the entire mortgage payment yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Uptown is at a 62% increase versus a year ago. However, the acquisition in Uptown is $1.37 million. So uh, again, you're looking at these numbers and you're like, where do I start, right? Do I have that kind of cash and where can I start? Finally, uh, Albany Park, 44% at a $464,000 uh, $464, average. Mm -hmm. Avondale, which is where everybody's going to, mm -hmm. and you cannot follow everybody. Look at your numbers and make sure they make sense for you on a monthly basis. Um, it's $558,000 to get into this neighborhood on an average for a two-flat uh, increase over a year ago was 20%. So those, I'm glad that you're looking at those numbers because you have to look at it from an you know analytics point of view. Those numbers are all great, but there's a problem. More and more people are taking on debt. So the affordability to afford these great neighborhoods and these properties is going to get a lot harder. So their model is an amazing model because right. everybody can afford it pretty much. You know, whether you're middle of the well, road or whether you're just a first time buyer, that model is always going to be safer than somebody who's going after a two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar uh, multi unit that needs repairs. And we're seeing more and more that people are just leveraging more and more debt. And well, I think that's the biggest concern, and that's what economists are fearful of, is the fact that people are taking so much debt, and now we're qualifying people who don't even qualify. So you're basically saying— Yeah, we're back to we're stated back income to loans. Exactly. Well, <laughs> they're back. Not no, we are. we are. No, we are. Yeah, well, I get and emails also, all the time from— A lot of people are fearful that, that whenever yeah. they, they roll out these kind of type of products, it's when you're creating like a situation where you want everybody to qualify, and so you're getting people into the market that don't necessarily qualify. And I don't yeah. need to be an elitist about it, but at the end of the day, it's like that's what kind of upsets the market. And, and I totally understand what you're saying, but I think that there's a give and take. And I think that's a balancing act that needs to happen. I think as some of the Dodd-Frank Act, you know, all those the rules and regulations are being repealed. There's going to be there needs to be something that bridges that gap and comes back. We give a little bit of freedom and then we take a little bit of it away, give it a little bit more, take a little bit of away. But I really think that we learned our lesson. As a country, right? In two thousand eight, two thousand nine. And I don't, and I don't <laughs> capitalist no, it society, takes, I don't think that we learned it. It takes anything. years and years and years of, of no regulations to get back to a, a position like that. So a couple years, you know, and a couple a couple regulations being rolled back is not gonna be the end of the world. I it, that's you know, that's my opinion. I think I think, oh go ahead. I was just gonna say, Carly, in the answer to your question, for advice to someone who is getting started, where to start. I think the danger of what happened with us was going to these seminars. They, there are so many different aspects to getting involved in or getting started with real estate, wholesaling, uh, buy and holds, rehabbing. And when it's presented to you in, in this like kind of frenzied fashion of you can do it and, yeah, yeah. and just start like a, making offers like a great and new then diet pill. get into the <laughs> property and the money will find you and, and all this, these kind of risky speculative strategies we just kind of threw out this big net we're like okay south side california you know uh buy and holds what like we just kind of started throwing everything out there and it we got into a, pos a position where we were making offers on properties in areas where we didn't really know that well so my mm -hmm. my my advice to someone who's just getting started focus on one area first just start to get to that get to know that area really well um, just start driving the neighborhoods. See like what properties literally are 10 there. square blocks. Yeah. Like no more than that. Start like we're not talking about talking one to, market right, or one neighborhood. Talking we're talking about sub-neighborhood, right? Yeah. Of like, yeah. Especially on the south side off, of Chicago tiny, tiny, where it's tiny. block by block. Yeah. Um, start talking to real estate agents in those areas that know those areas well. Uh, Get out of your start, car and walk. Exactly. Yeah. Um, start just investi investigating the price points and seeing what areas are you comfortable with. Some areas in the south side of Chicago, it's they're not necessarily the best places to be after 6 o'clock in the evening. And we bought properties in those areas without necessarily really knowing that. Did you have your furnace stolen yet? 
<laughs> we have all of our furnaces stolen. stolen. I've had, I've had, stolen. Yes, yes, I've had, had my furnace stolen. Been stolen. I've done projects out copper. there, and I've had furnaces yeah, stolen, toilets <laughs> stolen. Yeah. It's like, I just yeah. had took so the copper out of his All the appliances <laughs> were stolen at one of our yeah. current listings. Yeah, that so. happened. Our it first happens. house that we were flipping, and the next day we were on the phone. Every other house that we owned had an alarm But listen, that happens in every neighborhood, too. It's not just the south side. And I'm going to say the south side, but statistically, I mean, if you're going to go into a high-risk, high-reward neighborhood like we, you know, like we've been talking about, um, then you, you should take the necessary precautions to protect yourself. Yeah. So. It's kind but of a given, but I, I yeah. appreciate that you're saying Well, you would say it was a given, <laughs> but... Well, no, we, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I would also say join your local real estate investment group Absolutely. for that area. And don't buy any properties until you find some sort of mentor or someone who knows that area, like the back of their hand, mm -hmm. that can help you hold your hand walking through that whole process because there's a lot of different moving parts. There's there's getting into it at the right price where you think you're getting it and you're you're comping a property where you're using comps that are maybe three blocks away. But if it's like on the other side of a major road, it could be completely different, completely different yeah. township and, and you may be comping and using the wrong you know, properties. School districts really exactly. change the value. And I yeah. kind of know who your mentor is because he's sort of like my really good friend as well. So, uh, But I just want to you know, add to that. It is very true because in Chicago, one block is going to be completely different than the next block. And if you're looking like, I don't know, like when you're pricing out, not necessarily pricing out when you're scoping out a good opportunity, if you're looking at a single family, sometimes you don't want to be next to that two flat, right? Because there's oh, too yeah. much transition in the mom or parents because it's catering to that. Are not are we violating any rules here? But you know, when you the end user is not going to want to be next to a transient type of building when you're looking at single family. In some neighborhoods, you have like boarded up homes in the block next uh -huh. door, and so you have to be wary of that as well. Yeah. But what do you say to someone who's saying, okay, there's no inventory, there's no opportunity. So what do you mean you're taking your time to do all this research? You mean to another investor, somebody that's trying to get into? Right. There's inventory. I mean, what a lot of people don't know is that there's still a lot of REO properties coming on the market at auction that, you know, there is a strategy to the auction process, and that I'm still learning that process. But like Tyler was saying, the properties that we were getting into even two years ago are now 20% more expensive than they were. And so the strategy that, strategy that uh, the president of our real estate investment group that we belong to, uh, Andrew Holmes, with Chicago Real Estate Investment Group, he, he he's a big advocate of using the auctions to get into properties. And his strategy is long-term buy and hold, single family homes in areas where there's gonna be appreciation and they're in areas where the homeowner, the renter acts like a homeowner in the sense that they have that pride of ownership. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the multi-unit space, it's a little trickier because you gotta make sure that you get the right tenants into those properties. but. For, for the most part, if you are in the right areas, you know, it can be successful. So back to renting. So, exactly. Get it? So, but in terms of finding inventory when it seems like there's none, I mean, it sounds silly, but we found a, a lot of our a lot of our projects right off the MLS, right off of Redfin. I mean, it, and it, it, it sounds silly, but you should know every single house that's bought and every single house that's sold, every single house that comes to market, your Redfin alerts or realtor.com alerts, everything should go directly to your phone. You should be willing to call that listing agent within five minutes of hit, hitting the MLS. You need to be willing to go to that house that day. You need to ha be on every single wholesaler's list. You need to, you know, if you're the type to put up bandit signs because you don't want to pay a wholesaler between $2,500 and $5,000 to find a property for you because you think think that you want to do it yourself, then you should be willing to do that, right? You should be willing to give your business cards to everybody on the block when you're flipping a house and tell them that if they're ever trying to sell their house, you'd be willing to take it off their hands and renovate it into a beautiful home for a new, for a new family, right? Like you should be doing everything in your power to hustle your way to the next deal. It doesn't matter what market you're in. There's always going to be opportunity. You just have to find it so but look at that i mean there's no way nick can get away with doing that stuff he's not as cute as you guys i mean i get it people answer the door oh, sure yeah knock. we just knock on the door and <laughs> like, all right all right i got some house, i got some though. questions here because we're veering off our <laughs> bullet this point here guys adding up, adding up. this is a 30 40 Bombs minute show we're like <laughs> around you dude you're gonna have some problems in a little bit just wait <laughs> wait you said you were gonna be nice to me no i did not say that did he not I'm no sorry, you go. wished i would be nice okay to you. so one of the cool things that you guys do, obviously, is you go into these up-and-coming neighborhoods, right? And I want you guys to touch a little bit about Stage 2 properties and how you guys give uh, second opportunities to people that need it, right? People that have maybe entered our system, call it, and they need a second chance. And you guys do that 
with uh, helping out on these renovations, whether it be assisting, you know, the carpentry or uh, the tradesmen yeah. on, on, on electricals. Touch a little bit on, about that, uh, if you will, uh, on how you guys came about that, because that's a pretty cool feature you guys have. Yeah, so we, we kind of just fell into this whole, uh, I guess, the sp space of being in the, the south side of Chicago where we met a couple of contractors who hire former gang members and formerly incarcerated individuals who just haven't been able to get employment because of that, you know, felony on their record or, or what have you. And, um, you know, we've been, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I don't want to say that that is our whole business model and that's all of what stage two properties is. Um, we are a big advocate of redeveloping communities and our big mission of who we are and what we stand for is trying to write, re help revitalize some of these communities. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it takes a lot of cons uh, combined efforts from a lot of different organizations who I feel like now we're aligning ourselves with like neighbor uh, housing neighborhood services and uh, starting to meet aldermen and city council people to find out how we can actually get into some commercial space and start to try to revitalize some of the um, these areas by um, getting you know creating uh, not only the the residential market but also uh, retail space the retail space and that sort yeah. of thing. So we're still trying to figure that out in the, in the sense of from a, a macro level, but on, on just like what you were talk, touching on with um, what we've done so far is yeah, I mean we've had. Uh, former gang members help rehab our houses, and these guys are are incredible and, and amazing. And just to hear some of their stories and what they've overcome in terms of having gone through the whole gang system and gone through prison, and saying that you know if it wasn't for this job, they would either be dead or in jail. Wow, so, question: so. so, does the concept of stage two properties start with that in mind before you get started, or did that just evolve while you're on the job? You're like you run into some good people, and you're like, you know what? Yeah, he had a rough upbringing, but let's take a crack on this guy, and then it worked. So you tried another person, you tried another person, and then it evolved. Was it first or after you started doing flips? Good question. The latter. So okay. we were investing from Los Angeles for the first uh, six to nine months, and as we started coming out here more and more, spending more time at the job sites and talking to the guys and getting to know the people that were actually doing the work on the jobs, we started to hear their life stories. That's mm -hmm. what Colin was saying. Um, about just the obstacles they've overcome. A lot of these guys started getting wrapped up in the system at as young as 16, 17, 18 years old. They've got a record coming out of out of jail, coming out of prison by, you know, 22 years old. And right. then we figured out, we, we discovered that this job meant so much more to them than we thought it did. It wasn't we the money, thought, it was getting their life back on track. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, it yep. gave them a sense of purpose. And we actually, we've done a, a bunch of interviews because uh, we were working with a TV producer uh, in Los Angeles for a little while that wanted to highlight what we were doing here with these guys. Mm -hmm. And um, so we got to interview these guys and get to know them on a deeper level. And we... Uh, we this um, Stefan was talking to us about getting getting to you know instead of just uh, instead of just goofing around or gang banging is what he called it you know I don't mm -hmm. want to say oh gang banging but like instead of just gang banging with his friends and this and that and buying drugs or weapons or whatever reselling them on the streets he was getting up every day and going to a home that's in a community that he believes in you know, in a place where his family's from or he's from, his friends are from, and they would see him getting up to go to work to do demolition or learn about carpentry or come work on our jobs. And then his friends and his family were taking notice and they were saying, wow, like, we, how do we get involved in this? And so it was, you know, it was really inspiring. And he right. would say so, that his long-term goal was to own his own construction company where then he could hire, you know, people in, in the community to be able to do right. what he's doing currently. Yeah. Because who would so, know the neighborhood better than him, though? Exactly. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. yeah. Not no even you guys that are, that, are, exactly. that, are, that are working there. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really was, yeah, we leaned into that, and we tried to start helping from the inside out. So it was a post. Yeah. Post yeah so our, I guess our, our whole concept is to grow our business so that we're able to hire more of those contractors who are then providing those opportunities for people right. in, that, in those areas. Well, at the end of the day, the, the person buying the home I don't want to sound shallow here, but a homeowner or someone buying a home doesn't really care how it got there, just how it is when it is there. You know, and so there's, there's the fact that you're helping people along the way and, 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 and building some confidence and, and contributing to the neighborhood is a, is a huge plus, much like any corporation that would do charity work. 
At the end of the day, it's like helping hands is what charity work is. So, and in this case, you're, you're giving people an opportunity, mm -hmm. which is a helping hand. And I think that the homeowner or the potential buyer, if the quality of the work is good, that's all that matters to them. Yeah. Like that's really the end all, you know, what's the price? Mm -hmm. And do I like the job they did or not? Mm -hmm. Everything else is a backstory that's irrelevant to them and their finances now. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you guys are like, you know, you're, you're overseeing the project. So you're actually revitalizing <laughs> the neighborhood mm -hmm. and also giving, you know, giving people opportunity to work. Say in that again. Revitalizing. Re can we get um, into the uh, the nitro question because we're running short on time? Yep. Oops. Okay, so the that. nitro question is usually a question that has, sometimes has nothing to do with anything or whatever the case is. Oh, so there's two of you. <clears throat> now, all things considered, we're going to give you each a nitro question, <clears throat> but we're going to give you one nitro question, and I'll let you pick who wants to do which one. I'm going to give you one nitro question that is related to your current industry. Oh, no, no, just because I don't even know the question yet. It's like, an, like, well, my, is, is it the question right here, though? Is, he's is thinking it, it as he's question? asking it. <laughs> I think we have the question. Carla wrote it out here, so. Oh, Carla did. Somebody's trying to write my nitro questions Sorry. down? Bro, <laughs> <laughs> here's, your, here's your freaking script, bro. Not I in a million years. Never Are would someone write my I love I'm this not nitro even, question. I'm not no? even doing that shit. Okay. You know we're supposed to keep the show to, like, a specific time format. Yeah, the here's your nitro question. One's going to get a nitro question of... Of the industry, and one's going to get a nitro question from the old industry. Well, the, the industry that you're coming from. Um, he so, who wants to take who wants to take a qu nitro question from the old industry or fr from the previous and the current? Yeah, I'll take Hollywood. I'll take. Real. You take Hollywood. I'll take Hollywood. Hollywood. All right. We need to know <laughs> your nitro question is we need to know one of the most embarrassing experiences that you've ever had during your Hollywood career. So, nitro question doesn't have to be really, really relevant. You're going to get something a little bit more relevant. Okay, so you don't have to answer yet. You have oh, to hold on okay. there for about ten or fifteen minutes. Let it marinate. Actually, think of a good one. Actually, okay. think of a good one. Oh. Two minutes because we're running a little low okay, on time okay. here. Okay, we'll, we'll get All there. Right. Okay. All right, you got the industry question. Um, if you can start all over again, doing what you're doing, because it's been what a couple years? Yeah, uh, five in total, three and a half years. Three and a half years. Okay, five in total. If you could start from day one again, Absolutely. what is the biggest? mistake or thing you would correct moving forward. We all learn, right? So something you're just like, if I can get that one back, I would do it again. Mm -hmm. So park on that, think about it, and uh, better be good. I got an answer for that. I got an answer already. I would, my I'll answer to that one would be one. like, <laughs> <laughs> say no to Carla Mina in a, in, a, in a talk show idea. That's what my answer would be. That would be my rewind so, to 2000. Well, that's, mar well, that's marinating really quick. Um, I want to thank these guys, too, because they're helping us out with our St. Jude push this calendar year. So it's very important that we give back to some degree. Um, yeah, Colin participates in the triathlon yep. in uh, South Beach, Miami every year. Triathlon. And Colin comes and cheers me on. He does yeah. his own triathlon. Yeah. <laughs> it's a margarita. It's a shot of beer shot. and a margarita That's before noon. Triathlon. And I sit there and cheer him on. So we I'm totally good with the triathlon. I just don't like the running part, the swimming part. <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the other, and the other the part really kicks my ass, too. Like, so. I'm really excited part. about our event, though. Can you plug yeah, our event? So because I'm totally going to be July 22nd, it's a Sunday. From 1 to 4 p.m., we're going to be over at Mode Body Boutique uh, hosting our Global Warrior Fitness Challenge. It's going to be a rowing challenge, a cycling challenge, and a push-up challenge. And we're going to see if we can get Nick on the bench press, too, on the bench press challenge. Wait, so we need gr groups of individual participants or teams. So, we do. Hey, Nick, would you want to be on my team? I'm going to bench press you, <laughs> which is really easy. No, it's so, yeah, not. make sure you guys uh, reach out to us on social media or call us, text us. But we'd like you guys to come out on that day to register, whether it's a team event, a team of three, or you can do individual challenges. So hopefully you guys can make that, that outing as well. Where Let's, can people go online to donate to St. Jude? Uh, they can go to, <laughs> I don't know, our direct site. Can you inbox us for that information? Yeah, we'll definitely provide it. We have our own separate Global Warrior site, but you can go directly to stjude.com if, if need be. But we would prefer that we all come together. Individual. Just invite yes, your friends right. to come yeah. to the event. Okay. And that yeah. will give them more information then. Yeah, we have a promo running at the moment, so <laughs> it's out there. Well, let's get back to the Nitro question so we can Why wrap up. Why are you always up. making fun of him? Give Who? Him his Go more time Who are you I'm not right making now? fun of him. Oh. I'm making I, fun of you. <laughs> All right. We're, we're already... Well, I mean, we can finish no, off. The, we're actually out of time, so let's get this oh, okay, Nitro well, question. Well, yes, sir. He's running the show these days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all work yeah. for Grocco now. Yep. It's a 30-minute show. 
Okay. Okay. We're at 48. Okay. You keep <laughs> oh. you keep the logs now. Colin. <laughs> We're overachievers. Oh, I'm gonna answer the nitro question first, okay. and then Colin's gonna answer. All right. Can I just go? Whatever. Let it rip. Oh, okay. So one thing, if I could go back to the beginning of real estate and change, uh, I wouldn't sell a house, ever. Okay. Cool. I wouldn't sell a single house. Um, I would hold on to every single house. And not flip them in retail quality. I'd flip them in rental quality. And I keep them. I put tenants in and I rent them out. Um, you know, I was talking about, you know, there used to be really great margins on the south side and they're slowly shrinking. Well, even the great margins, you look back at that money, where'd that money go? It went to the next house. It went mm -hmm. back to pay financiers. It went to your bills, this and that. Now we're, you know, as we're getting into multifamily, we're looking at the cash flow that we're getting right. from these properties. That's why I asked the question right saying, out of the gate. Yeah, so it's renting. like, whoa, we can, we can make that much Per, before we get out of bed, yeah. wait, what? So every single time we do this, we do three or four of these a year, yeah. you know, scale it up from there. Every door we're making how much money? I would just do that. Yeah. Um, and I would focus on, uh, I would focus on four unit apartment buildings. Um, and I would know the neighborhoods now, you know, know what I know now about the neighborhoods, take a little right. bit more time to find those, those properties and be a little bit more patient uh, in finding those properties. And I just hold on to them, build a portfolio. Without ever selling, without ever flipping. Yeah. Look, I'm an advocate that to I that. I don't love flipping. No, flipping's great. Yeah. I'm an advocate to that because I personally, I, I do have a lot of property on Southside, yeah. like South Shore, 77th okay. and all that stuff. Yeah. And I've had them for years and everybody in this room knows that I've bought them in 2013, really cheap, Cool. Uh, rented them forever. And it's now finally time where I'm considering considering yeah. selling them. Um, and what I've found is that area doesn't work like some other areas it, it does work. There's great opportunities to do some flips. You get the right property, you put just enough money in, and you make a nice hefty profit. It does work. But you can't force that on every single property. Sometimes it's just better to buy it, park it, mm -hmm. enough to get good rent from it, and then the time will come when yeah, it's right, it's if you will, sure. to, to make the next move. So, uh, But that's why I asked earlier. And it's, a, it's a good way of doing it. And when you mentioned that your coach uh, or the, your mentor – was that's his philosophy? I was like, okay, then that makes sense. Can I ask a question though? Now that you're speaking, because I know your your inventory is pretty diverse. I mean, you have condos and yeah. houses, and a yeah. lot of us focus on two flats, right? That's where buyers are kind of I'm not these days. picky, but so what do you say to that? Like, where should you focus if you're going to hold? I mean, for flipping, or would you consider condo flipping? I don't consider anything specific to anything like it's hard to explain. I think that every property has its own story and its own potential in its own way. So to tell you, oh, flip all condos is just the stupidest advice I could possibly give somebody. To tell you, rent all two units and three units. No, I might be able to buy a two or three unit really cheap and then just do some basic work and still sell it for a fortune. So I think every scenario is its own thing. But I will say this. The one thing that I preached when we talked about the crash and we talked about, you know, are we heading that way again? I don't think we're heading that way again or we can't possibly go that way again because there's something missing in today's escalating real estate market that didn't hap that happened in the uh, boom, if you will. In the boom, we were trading real estate like penny stock. We were buying it at X and trying to sell it within six months because we're going to make a ton of money. How many condos did you flip like that? Like literally, you put a contract down on a condo for 300 It hasn't even been sold yet. It's still being developed, and the minute it's ready for his occupancy, yeah, we yeah, have yeah. sold and it. And I got my earnest money back. But, but just let me finish. No. You had enough you time. You missed no? that. You missed that. No, you missed it because you were blind to it. You were blind to but it. But don't blame us. So, anyways, what would happen I is you would literally, school. you would literally, yeah. the condo would finally be finished. You bought it for three hundred under contract, right? Mm -hmm. Put down your five percent. You're gonna be the buyer. The condo's finished. It's ready for your occupancy. You're like, I'm not moving in. I'm gonna sell it. Someone comes in and buys it for three forty. You never took out a loan, did a piece of work, anything. And so people are out there buying new constructions because they're gonna be worth five or six or ten more percent in three weeks, and that is the speculation that exploded the bubble. Mm. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Here comes some bad advice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Why, I'm for the love of God? You haven't had enough time. No, it's not about that. Is that you're saying, okay, so you're talking about pre-construction purchases, right? Is that no, what you're talking about? No, it was about? an example. But it was, you were talking about that. Every property is different. There's people that were no. speculating is what I was saying. People speculated. No, and that was an example said. of how people speculated. People would yeah. buy any type of property. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention, you'd understand that I was saying speculation is the key word. But you're saying the reason why we cannot be in this bubble, we cannot because be Because speculation in... doesn't exist like it used to. Because people just... aren't trying to buy a house and flip it in three weeks like they used to. That's yes, what was happening are. in 05. Call wholesalers. Not nearly. Where homes change hands four times before they get to the. You're just going to argue to argue, but the reality is, is a speculative I'm buyer a realtor, is not around. So I know what's going on in the market. Wholesale doesn't even. Guys, doesn't... are you buying properties through wholesalers oh, versus lord. realtors? Can you? 
Well, Here look, we look, this, was, you, this, was, a dude, totally dude, this is a totally different conversation. This is a totally different People in 2005 were buying a house from a realtor listed on the market. I understand that, Nick. But no, it's you're a, not then. Because you're talking about wholesalers in the same conversation. It's the same thing. It's just a different All way right. of doing well, we're talking business. about a house that's, uh, with all due respect, we're talking about a house that's uninhabitable. A house that at the end, when we're done flipping it, would be worth one hundred and sixty-five yeah. to one hundred eighty thousand dollars. They're tacking on a three thousand dollar wholesale fee onto a purchase price of fifty thousand dollars. That isn't, and it, and no no bank is going to loan on that house. I think what Nick's talking about is a house that's ready for occupancy that you put under contract, and then three weeks later, without even signing a loan, it's already increased by no. five or ten percent. Right. Yeah. We're talking about a three thousand dollar fee. And on, I we're going. That. You know, yeah. Let me that. let me it's, unwind it yeah. though. I think everyone took a sample. And misunderstood what I was saying, though. The speculation, people were trading real estate like a stock in 05 because we witnessed it. Mm. We saw so many people coming in to buy a property that had no intention of really holding it, mm. no intention of even renting it. Does that make sense? They had no intention of doing anything. The property didn't even need work in some cases, right? They said, everything's going up 20% in a year, so I'll sell it within six months and make my money. Yeah, but man, you're going to pay a $2,000, $2,500 a month payment. Mm. He's like, yeah, but I'm making... 40 grand, so I'll eat 12 and yeah. make 40. That's what they were doing in 2005. Nobody is doing that today. They're buying these things with a little bit more of a, a perspective of whole. Real estate isn't meant to be flipped like penny stock. I mean, don't get me wrong. Certain flips do happen. Flipping houses is a big phenomenon right now because there's a lot of great discussed properties still in the, the debris left over from the crash, if you will. But when people are taking brand new stuff or stuff that doesn't need work and trying to do that same game with like what we would consider a flip where you have to put some elbow grease into it, that's what was happening in 05. That's what happened is a lot of people, I knew a mailman who had 10 houses. He had yeah, 10 I mean, properties. Let say. me just give you when an example. Taxi he had 10 properties. You, you know. So your, your, your mailman has 10 properties, has no intentions of renting them, has no intentions, of, doesn't have a plan on them. He just knows they're going to be worth more than about four or five months. He's going to sell them all and make a ton of money because he could do it with no money down. That's what blew that up. Now you can't buy a house and investment property with no money down. That's one thing that doesn't exist. You have to put some money down. Even if it's owner-occupied, at least 3% is going in it. You were doing investment property loans in 2005 with no money down. Mm -hmm. Just sign here. In fact, you go to closing and end up getting five or six grand back because of the tax credit. Mm -hmm. So you made a profit you signed in your name, and then you'll sell it three months from now for 10 more percent. Yeah. That doesn't happen in today's market. That's my point. I tried you it. Can't in possibly recent, do it in recent times. I tried it. You can't You're do the it. Worst buyer <laughs> well, no, in no, the hear world. me out. Whatever I was trying to do. park. I was trying to. The idea was you park earnest money on new construction, on a condo tower that's going to take two to three, four years to build out. So if I get in at an early price, call it three hundred thousand, during those three, four years, my three hundred thousand is going up in value. I would close on the property, and because the programs that existed back in the day were zero percent down, I would literally get my earnest money back. And at the same time, I would sell it at a slightly higher price and make a profit. You can't do that today because you have to. Now there's seasoning laws yeah. with financing. If yeah. you haven't owned the property at least three months, you can't even sell it yet. Because no. like on FHA financing, if someone's trying to buy one of your properties but it's shorter than 90 days, mm -hmm. they'll make you park it. Yeah. It's a very comprehensive set of regulations that got us These are all preca that got us precautions that, that. Were, yeah. that were not around But I feel like five. it's time where they start to. It'll but even, up. even, It'll even your time. stated, but even your stated income loan that you mentioned earlier uh -huh. requires twenty five percent down. Oh yeah, yeah. It required not, nothing down <laughs> yeah, in 05. Could, well, That's the difference between a, pulse, a bubble and yeah, like they, you know, yeah. could there be a slowdown in the market? Sure, but like Colin said earlier, cool. as long as you find the property cheap, you can make money in any market. Grocker was flipping homes in 09 when no one wanted to touch real estate and made a killing on them in 09. So I mean, you can make money. In any market, like you'll hear famous stockbrokers and traders saying, yo, you know, yeah, the market's terrible, but people know how to make money in this market and that market. That's never, that should give no one pause as far as trying to buy and sell real estate for a profit. The question is, you can't treat every piece of real estate the same exact way as the last one because they're so different. You might need to buy and hold in some cases, and in some cases you can flip it in three, three months. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But it's, you know, is there a slowdown? Sure. So what? Let it slow down. Let it go down 10%. There'll still be deals out there. So let's get to the final Nitro question, which is Collins. Colin. You want to recap you got, you got, you got Let us know what your most embarrassing moment in your acting career was. Well, it, it's a toss-up. Uh, it's hard to decide. One was... It's, <laughs> I had this, uh, it's hard really, to decide, huh? <laughs> it's hard to decide. That's good. You got some good stuff. Now there's two nitro <laughs> questions. Oh, scoring. <laughs> uh, so I'd gone in for this audition for this film, and 
uh, it came down between me and these two other guys, and they ended up choosing this other guy, and I was like, ah, you know, bummed because I didn't get it. So then they called me back a week later saying that that, that other guy went to go do a Steven Spielberg movie that I needed to come back and audition one more time with the lead actress. And her name was Brooke Langton. She had just done this movie with Keanu Reeves, and I was like, oh, wait, amazing, awesome. Yeah. So I go to the audition, and I was so nervous, and I, you know, I was rushing to get there, and I had to go to the bathroom, so I sign in, and... Casting director was like, all right, you know, uh, Brooke comes out. She's like, all right, cool, you know, nice to meet you, Colin. Uh, they're like, okay, we're going to start. I said, all right, I just need to go to the bathroom real quick. Go into the bathroom. And I was in such a rush that, you know, as a guy, sometimes you, you forget to yeah, kind of yeah. shake off the excess. <laughs> oh, and boy. so I uh, did my business and just threw it back in there and zipped it up and nice. realized that. Wait, what? <laughs> she, Wait, don't, what? she don't understand. She never hit. She you know, you got to even... shake the dew yeah. off the lily. You peed on his pants. <laughs> You know, really so to scary, speak, don't man. No, keep telling your okay. so, okay. story. Oh my God. I zip up and realize that I had a little spillage in my All pants, right. and I was like, "Ah!" So I had like gray pants and a big wet spot nice. in my crotch. So, oh, and yikes. they're like expecting me. So I like turn on the air dryer, and I'm like <laughs> sticking my crotch, trying to like dry off. And yeah, finally, I just pulled my shirt out of my my pants, and I just kind of covered it up and went in there. Yeah, it doesn't happen to well, you ever. Nailed you go. the audition, <laughs> got the you, movie, did you get to, you got, There you there go. That's go. All. Ladies the and gentlemen, one, I was at this Armani party in New York City. <laughs> George Armani, uh, you know, all these celebrities. And it was at the Armani store, and there's an elevator to come up to the second floor of the, of the store, and there was a dinner, and, and Martin Scorsese was there. And I go by the elevator, just kind of just look out and see what, like, what the clothes were. The elevator opens up. And I don't get very starstruck, but out comes one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my entire life. She's one of my Hollywood crushes, Kate Blanchett. Oh, so she yeah, walks out. I love her. Love her. Oh. Love her. <laughs> she walks out. She looks at me. I look at her. It was love at first sight <laughs> for me. She was married. <laughs> and I was like, I, I literally, I couldn't she speak. Was and I she was like, hey, you know, how do you know that? I was like, yeah. That's my bad Australian accent. <laughs> I, I was like, I was like. Yeah, and she looks over at the clothes, and I look over the clothes, and then she looks back at me, and I go, the only thing that I could find to come out of my face was, so you're from Australia? <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me, and she's like, that yeah. happens and then she yeah. turned Every and walked away, and I was like, no! Yeah. My, that's the only thing I could think of at that moment. And then she told you your pants are wet. And she told me your pants are wet. So what did we learn? <laughs> Colin's game is bad against idols. Yep. And he doesn't wear underwear. That's disgusting. <laughs> I can't believe it. Uh, All right, we got to wrap, guys. They're kicking us out okay. of the studio. Oh, okay. Wait, we didn't even get we, to your we, nitro question. Yeah, we did. We answered mine well, first. Did. Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> are you on the show? Bro, I don't really? argue about the bubble. <laughs> like, are you serious? <laughs> Sell everything now. <laughs> She missed that. Oh, I was geez. trolling with our now. little guest over here. Right. She's Sorry. busy. She's running the show. She's got a lot of responsibility, you know? She's running the show. She's on the phone. That's what it is. She's Jeez. texting. I have a point this I'm sorry. Can you guys introduce yourselves again? <laughs> <laughs> and where are you from? Tell us your stories. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, oh my, God. Wow. my name is Colin Nightsoul. This is Tyler Edgefield. Right, we're from Hollywood. Let's close that. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. All right, boys. Can you close this out, somebody, please? Close this out. Hey, Grocco, oh. thank you so much for yeah, having us. Yeah, thank you, Grocco. And I thank hope you, that uh, thank you, I'm Nick. flying into town on the 22nd on the day of the event. Hopefully I can make it. I'll All right, brother, I appreciate again. it, man. Thank you, Grocco. Yeah. Thank you, Grocco. <laughs> Pleasure to see you, Carla. <laughs> anytime, man. Anytime. All right. Well, you can follow this show and all Market Overdrive shows every Thursday at 530 on our Facebook forward slash Market Overdrive. Of course, we're at Twitter, handle at Market Overdrive. Our YouTube channel has it live, as well as our Facebook page. Um, you can go to our website, marketoverdrive.com. And last but not least, download the podcast at WGN Radio on the WGN Radio family. We will see you back here one week from today at 530. See you then.